The illusion of hope, you know, kept me going for a bit. Uh, <clears throat> and it's anyway, it's not an easy place to kill yourself in the Thai jail. Hello, David McMillan here. Who the hell am I? For decades, I ran a courier and contraband smuggling network across 50 cities, built my own equipment, created my own disguises, and used almost every device imaginable to escape detection. Retired now, I bring you the experiences of the underworld. I've met the worst and the best of 10,000 criminals and know people at a glance. You get the fine details of 40 years crossing borders, concealing goods, escaping, hiding, and becoming something else. Is this a life you could survive? No. That reminds me of when you buy, you're trying to buy drugs and someone promises you the world. <laughs> oh, okay. You just kind of know yeah, something's yeah, yeah. not right and then suddenly your money's gone <laughs> and they don't come back. Um, there was a, a, a great drought in uh, London of just about everything uh, back in 2010. And people were uh, cheating all the time. And you go somewhere. And now, if you find yourself on the 10th floor of uh, uh, you know, a, a council block um, <laughs> and uh, there's three or four people in the same stairway, um, you kind of know you're in for a rough time. So, um, I don't know. Um, perhaps um, perhaps we learn some kind of forgiveness for that, up to a point. Depends how much damage done, of course. Yes. You know, I, um, I, there's a couple of things I, I sort of wanted to ask you, really. Sure. What, um, David, while you do it, I'm just going to drop my backdrop because I'm a bit of a perfectionist and, and it's a centimetre too high, but I'm listening. A centimetre? That's a... Look, fix that up immediately. It's awful. Uh, you, you might be... Um, you're missing out on Spitsbergen and Svalbard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've, I've lived... Uh, where have I been? Where's Iceland? So there... Yeah. So yeah, I've been to as Iceland. I've worked in the north of Norway, which was just an absolute delight. Just one of the best years of my life working on a a small island in the North Atlantic. Right. Chopping, uh, you didn't find it. Um, you know, I mean, did you have any company? Um, yes, it was. Um, there was a small population there, no more than sort of. Oh, 3,000 people, if if that really. You had to get a right. fer ferry to get there, obviously, which, which complicated or, um, you know, probably made it less attractive for a lot of people. Right. And the vast majority of the island were all employed by the local fish factory, hen hence why I rocked up there. Okay, yeah. And I learned oh. how to fillet salmon very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, it, I've always been impressed by uh, somebody who's good with a filleting knife. I knew a Chinese guy, Jimmy Wong. He could bone a chicken in four minutes. Now, that might sound like a generous enough time, but there's a lot of little fiddly bits with that. Of course, he had a bad temper. So um, being a good um, filleter and boner and a bad temper, you won't be surprised to know that it was in a prison that I met him in. His bad temper got away from him. He was Vietnamese. He'd um, uh, escaped, if you want to put it that way, from uh, Vietnam, been caught on the boat, taken back. Um, and he was telling me that, um, of course, the, the, the soldiers who, who captured him relieved him of, and all of the rest of them of their money. So he had, uh, the only thing he had left was some diamonds, which he swallowed. And 
his hands were, um, you know, that awful position where they, uh, your upper arms are tied with wire behind your back. Uh, so you can't really do anything. So he had to uh, poo out this diamond every so often, uh, give it a bit of a wash as best he could and swallow it back down again. It, uh, <laughs> but he eventually got to freedom. Mm. So it was a happy ending, uh, nonetheless. You were going to ask me some, oh, some things. Yes. Um, I understand you were in uh, Northern Ireland um, with, a, with a company or group. Um, and I guess you were pretty young at the time, weren't you? What was it, 19, 20? Yes, I was, uh, gosh, I probably had my 20th birthday in Belfast. Right. Did you find that, um, <clears throat> uh, this is a sort of a, kind of a comparison uh, I'm thinking of, um, I found in the, uh, having moved from the, the hippie drug world into the smuggling business world, and there was a kind of a, a, a group, you could say, of fellow smugglers and scallywags. And uh, as a group, you felt kind of a, a disconnect from the rest of society in a way. You know, you started observing them as, uh, well, at worst, potential witnesses, um, <laughs> at, uh, at, at best, uh, people who might help you in your path or, or just get in your way. Did you get that disconnect? Um, being in a, a troop and you could rely on your uh, fellow servicemen, of course, and, and they were your friends. But um, did you start to look around, especially in Northern Ireland, with great suspicion that just the general populace? Yes, yes and no. It's, it's a difficult, it's not cut and dry in Northern Ireland because obviously you've got the Protestant community who who is a... English or British servicemen you're very much in favour with. Right. And then, of course, you've got the, the Catholic community, some of whom are, I don't know if ambivalent is the right word, but politically mm -hmm. they just want to live in peace. Right. But, of course, there is a percentage of that community that doesn't want you there and doesn't um, and mm. wants a united island. So you really... And, and of course, when you look at somebody in the street, you can't tell someone's religion by looking at them. If, if not, not, not in Europe anyway, or not. Sorry, not a, not a. a no, no, it doesn't stand out. There's no real features, yeah. except I suppose you'd start to get perhaps um, a feel for um, people who might be um, dedicated to your destruction. Uh, well, it's interesting you say, because one of the chaps I served with one day said, he said, fellas, you know, like as servicemen, we wear a second uniform when we're in our civilian clothes. And we did. We we would wear desert boots, um, faded jeans and, and a sort of surfing T-shirt. Right. These infamous Helly Hansen jackets that the lads would buy to wear in Norway they're kind of a fleece jacket and the instant you saw that rig as we called it mm. you know that's a fellow marine there's, there's no no, yeah. no no question especially if they've got the uh, skinhead or a or a crew cut yeah and so one of our chaps came up with a notion that the IRA players as we called them they had the same thing and that they would wear a certain uh. up so that they could recognize each other and then i came across this again in hong kong um in the nightclub i worked in which as you know the nightclub communities worldwide especially in asia are run by the criminal yes yeah. fr fraternity and these young gangsters in in triad speak they're called magi little horses they would all wear or the 14k who was the gang that own that ran the club I worked in right they would all wear white shell suit tops like sort of England football tops and white training shoes and to me being in that environment and having come there as a you know fr from the service community yeah it was glowingly obvious that this that these guys you know they reckon they, I thought so anyway um when I pointed it out to my sort of 
non-service person counterparts or friends they they thought I was absolutely crazy <laughs> which uh, I later became so uh, well you know uh, to go crazy you've got to work at it it doesn't come overnight you've got to, uh, you've got to try hard so, yeah. any advice I suppose um are we recording now yeah I've just hit I've hit record just because yeah why not you I never know when I've you're ever, like David I don't think I've ever not heard something fascinating come out of your 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 mouth from you know i've know i know you've met sean um, yes he's a great guy isn't he yeah, he's, uh, yeah sean, sean very kindly had me on his show twice now i think right. have you met james english uh, uh yes but not um i haven't recorded anything with him no yeah uh, okay yeah oh james james is a, a is a great guy um mm. And then I've seen you on the television, obviously. And uh, my yeah, gosh. Been around. <laughs> yeah, well, you can tell that you've lived and you're also very humble with it, which is a... Yeah. Mm. Well, I suppose I should, um, if, if this is somewhere near the beginning of what uh, uh, what you'll send out, I, I suppose in in brief to introduce myself to somebody who's just stumbled out of uh, out of the blue, um, for I'm 64 now, uh, but from the ages of uh, 20 to uh, uh, mid 50s, I suppose, um, I was a smuggler. Began with uh, a bunch of uh, retired safe crackers who had nothing much else to do with their ill-gotten gain, but um, they were a very trustworthy group because they had to be, um, and it was probably. Um, a better introduction to the underworld than say uh, coming in from the from the drug side um, and uh, failed in quite a few things had some successes um, again smuggling gold video heads believe it or not uh, you know whether wherever there's a price discrepancy uh, between anything um, there's suddenly a black market um, you know and um, I ended up using uh, couriers, but I worried about them so much, Chris. I, I was actually traveling with them on the edges, making sure they didn't wander off. Risks I'd take myself, kind of just to push the envelope. I wouldn't allow them. I used to dress them. I made sure their belts had no metal in them. Their shoes didn't trigger off any uh, detectors, not because they were perhaps doing a, a body pack. It's not that. You know yourself, once an official starts to take an interest in a person, that can elevate and go on and on and on and get worse. So I wanted them to, you know, travel smoothly. And the, the best of them were, um, by nature, gamblers, um, but um, fantasists. They lived in a kind of fantasy world. One of my best ones used to imagine he was an international tennis player or a music producer or something like that. And his confidence radiated out from him, so he just sailed through. But um, in uh, after some operations in uh, Australia, they went all bad. Um, and I ended up, um, well, it was a massive arrest. My wife was arrested too. There were no drugs. You know, if you were ever arrested, Chris, <laughs> touch wood, never happen on something where there's really not much evidence, no solid thing, it turns ugly. Because on uh, one side, uh, the accused think they're going to uh, wriggle out of it. The police are not happy. They start shortcutting and inventing things. It can be vicious. My wife ended up... Uh, being held without bail and my partner's wife too both of them killed in a prison fire three weeks after our arrest i mean i was in supermax because of that because the police put it about that i was getting rid of witnesses starting at home um served uh, 10 years there and pretty much went straight back to it um the operations were in in thailand um afghanistan India and Colombia, all source countries, um, and twice ended up facing the um, death penalty, I guess, really only seriously in Thailand, and uh, managed to get over the wall uh, from Klong Prem prison. 
Mm. Um, and then I'd lose complete lives and then rebuild another one, always under a, a, a new name, new identity. It would have a house, people, friends within it. Then that would be destroyed again. Eventually, I just ran out of years to do it and the will to go on. So, uh, did you ever meet Howard on your in Howard your... Marx? Yeah, yes, a couple of times. Um, the, the connection there was the Philippines and um, <clears throat> the late great <laughs> underhanded snake Lord Tony Moynihan, a uh, disgraced peer, fled England under a cloud of fraud allegations, um, set up base in Manila. I went there to see him back in 79, wanting to uh, get him to friendship a container of tie sticks. Now, what I wanted from him was perfectly straightforward, but he really put on such a show of, I um, mean, thick with President Marcos, who was a dictator at the time. People might remember Imelda Marcos, um, Ferdinand Marcos's wife, who, who was famous for her 3,000 pairs of shoes. I'm um, just Howard Marx we were talking about. And I, uh, Lord Tony in the Philippines was trying to trick me into betting on a rigged cockfight game. Now, these cockfights, you think, well, what are they? Some backstreet garage operations with a few pesos being bet, but they weren't. They were in, were in huge kind of... Uh, boxing arenas and the cockfights would be over within seconds really they're, they're, these little rangy looking birds were equipped with um, six inch sides attached to their legs and how can you bet on them you don't just the wrong peck in the wrong direction goes straight through the skull or the eye of the other bird but he thought that um, if we killed our own bird we could bet on the other one now, the whole thing, as you can imagine, it was very flaky. I, by the way, the, the, he came to me because I had a, a kind of technical interest in, in electronics, and the idea was to put a capsule in the scruffy neck of, uh, of our chicken <laughs> and explode it remotely into its jugular and, and end its days before it uh, actually killed the other bird. Whether that would have worked too well, I don't know. You know, explosives don't always do what you hope they'll do. No. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> and his idea was that he would say on the test one, "Oh, that worked perfectly." Now I'm going to put in uh, fifty thousand. They would come along, jump in on this, and he would have taken the quarter of a million, and then something would have happened. You know, that moment. That, and con men like Lord Tony. They live for the pleasure of um, deceiving you. Uh, you, you. You know, I bet you that the ones you've come across, there's been something, their real enjoyment is less their financial gain out of it than some kind of glorying in that they've got one over on you. And they have that. Now, I warned uh, uh, Howard about him, especially after um, Lord Tony had um, helped the Australian Federal Police uh, get a better conviction by sending a fake uh, SAS commander to Australia to arrange a helicopter escape from the prison I was in. It was patently that this guy was um, really, okay, it was plain enough he was another con man like uh, Lord Tony, but why they wanted, Lord Tony insisted that he go to the docks, that he make inquiries about helicopters. Lord Tony said to well, Percy, that was his name, the would-be SAS commander, no, they might be watching you, so you go around to these places. Now, the real reason for all of that, because it was arranged with the federal police that they would film all of this, Percy commander man doing these things, and... Uh, four days before the uh, trial began, the, the big drug conspiracy trial, um, Percy was arrested, my accountant was, who was uh, giving him $5,000 uh, hush money in a hotel. It was all over the paper. So it's not a great way to start a trial when you're, the first thing your jury hears is that uh, the four of you were trying to get out of the maximum security prison by helicopter. It, it, 
you know, kind of smudges your copybook a little bit. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, it was pretty clear that, um, oh, he, he liked to tell people too that he was, uh, he worked for MI6, uh, which is the, the foreign branch, isn't it, of uh, our intelligence services. Mm. Um, I'm sure he was, uh, they might have used him in the past. He was stationed in West Africa for a while. And he eventually uh, shopped Howard Marx too. And Howard ended up with an eight year stretch in Florida, uh, courtesy of uh, Lord Tony. Sadly, um, Lord Tony appears to have died of uh, a heart attack in uh, Manila a few years ago. Or as I like to think of it, met with an accident. <laughs> yes. uh, I can imagine that happened a lot in your line of work. Um, yeah, um, that, that was the, the, the catchphrase of a, uh, my earliest mentor um, who uh, taught me a few things. Um, you know, if I'd ask about somebody who, um, you know, one of our friends had been ambushed and killed, um, and they wouldn't give back the body. His parents were, were very upset about that. Um, and when I asked about uh, Dennis, the guy who'd been behind it, my mentor said, Dennis, no, I heard he met with an accident. You know? So I knew what that meant. How, how did you, um, how, what made you, uh, did you find it cathartic uh, writing your, your stories? Uh, no, what, whatever the opposite of cathartic is, that was... <laughs> Frenzied and uh, anxiety yeah. causing, was it? Well, it's like this. I think the way the human body works or the mind and, and, and the mind and body together is things are in the past for a reason and, and, and we move on, right? And that helps us to cope with trauma and this kind of stuff. Um, when I left Hong Kong, which was what, so let's just say 20 years ago now, 1996, uh, so was that 24 years ago and how long were you in hong kong i was there 13 months after leaving the the marines right and in that short amount of time i managed to get myself so um chronically unwell through crystal meth addiction mm. when i came back to the uk the doctors the mental health community told my dad look you're gonna have probably have to put him in an institution no and it's unlikely he he will ever leave okay so the reason i'm saying that david is it um it it, it i don't have any any re regrets in life i just believe in experiences but I was really damaged coming back from that place. Right. When I look back, I was a shell of a person physically and mentally. Very, very unwell. How many days would you be, you know, up nights on the meth? Uh, the longest was nine, wow. nine nights without sleep. You know, that can be really damaging. After all, you know, uh, as an um, interrogation device, um, sleep deprivation is used and, and normally people don't last more than about four or five days. Yeah, that's the incredible thing about meth. In, in, in the UK, it's not really a drug that many people are aware of. A lot of people confuse it, crystal meth, with what we call methamphetamine, but they're two, the separate- Yes, yes, yeah, yeah yes, I understand. Is the purified version of base amphetamine, which is a very, very strong. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes, you don't need much. Is there any, by the way, is there any connection with, I knew a guy who was um, a, quite a slick um, um, futures trader and you know, also a bit of a scoundrel with uh, taking on people's identity and all of that. But he, um, he had his real passion was, uh, I think he called it not methadone, but mephadrone or something like that. It, it was one of the, your video has gone yeah, again. It'll right. probably bounce back in a second. But I think it was in that group of, 
you know, uh, amphetamine type of things. It, That's uh, called me in, in the slang in the UK for that is meow meow. Oh, right. Okay. Or meow. It, 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 um, or bath salts, I think it was, uh, <laughs> went yeah. under the name of at one point. I think because you could buy it on the net, I might be getting my stories mixed up. But yeah, mm. that, that was, um, they're all in the same kind of chemical molecular mm. group. I, I, obviously, no, I'm not a scientist, but the meth is just so incredibly strong. It, 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 it's it's got to be damaging, really. It's so strong. I've always, I, and even when I was young and I had you know, a bit more interest in uh, speedier drugs, uh, I felt uh, more than just um, a hangover. I felt like brain cells had been fried after a while. Um, yeah, they say with meth, because you, you smoke it as a vapor, or that's at least one of the ways you can. Not, mm. not as a smoke, like, for example, heroin, but as a vapor. Um, and, of course, that vapor is going into the... I'm, I'm guessing it goes through the blood barrier in your brain by nature of the fact it's... Well, it gets into your bloodstream, doesn't it? So, yeah. Uh, I mean, and and then of course if something's vapor it can recrystallize and mm. so the the permanent the potential i think to do permanent brain damage is there i was i never did an awful lot david i i had a i don't even know if i had a, a compared to some people in hong kong i had a very low tolerance some guys would inject oh gosh enormous amounts of this stuff like four times a day Really? Then they would go off and function as lawyers and blooming bankers. And well, uh, uh, hats off to them. I don't know how they could function. Uh, to uh, me, I, all of the, all of my experiences with that category, I believe that what I'm doing is useful, makes sense. And the next, you know, when, when I've come to a couple of days later, I've looked looked at what I've written down, and it's even more gibberish. Uh, than those uh, bits of wisdom when you've had a puff or a joint or something, and then three o'clock in the morning you say, "Wow, Chris, why is white white?" <laughs> and it goes on <laughs> that <laughs> sort of you know that line. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> oh, but uh, uh, if you if you've ever um, uh, I find too, if you want to torment somebody in a, in a teasing kind of way, uh, who's a bit of a, a stoner and pothead, uh, when they've had a good old lungful, start explaining something kind of technical to them. Now, you can make it up as you go along. It doesn't really matter what it is, but part of their brain will be clawing to try and follow it. And another part will be tormented by it. They'll, they'll end up running away and hiding, I think. I, I, I haven't, I haven't really smoked pot for a long time now. It, it just, it didn't agree with me for ages. The only times it did agree with me was when I had a few beers first, and that combination <laughs> stuck with me for way more years and was probably healthy. Yeah. But it did get to the point where, when I was stoned, it, I just almost got to the point I couldn't remember my own name at, at times, and I, and I didn't even smoke a lot, maybe half a joint or something. Right, and it it would be potentially highly embarrassing, especially if you met someone that you knew really well. Right, but it it's just it's either there or it's not there, right? From a brain perspective, and well, you can't and, remember their name and so on. <laughs> oh, it was just it got to the point where it became acutely embarrassing, and uh, I I'd be in the middle of talking like this, and then I'd stop. Mm. And I, I had no idea what what the hell was it. I was what what were we just talk? And I, I just have to say to the person, sorry, what were we talking about again? Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think probably. Yeah, you know, that, that because it, it just seems to me too, because all of the recreational, just about all of the recreational drugs are um, uh, illegal. Um, there, there's no proper uh, pharmacological control or, or not, you know, big companies making sure you, you know exactly what you're getting and how long the effects are. And there's also no off button. 
it's only really the first, even if you have a drink, it's the first 20 minutes that are kind of really great. And then you end up chasing that little first buzz. And it seems to me it applies to almost everything. Um, the onset of whatever it is you've taken is good. And then it's kind of all downhill from there. I pretty much these days I just can't be bothered. Uh, I haven't, I haven't got the interest or, or the will for it. And there's nothing, it's never moved on. It's not as though there's some, you know, uh, great little bit of entertainment you can have when you've got a couple of hours and you take tablet A. And then when you're sick of all of that, you take tablet B and you can just go to sleep happily and wake up without a hangover. Gosh, yeah, that, that would be utopia, wouldn't it? But it, it mm. I think eventually all of us old hippies, we just get fed up of the muck around. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fed yeah. up of it, fed up of... Being street cornered and uh, being uh, uh, sold rubbish. There was a guy on, uh, um, and this little, his little clip went viral, complaining about the, the poor quality of uh, pub grub, you know, the... Those wraps of coke that are absolutely rubbish, God knows what. And it must have chimed with so many people that have been disappointed. It, it, it kind of went everywhere. I, I, I picked it up and did a, a video on it on my own channel. But uh, I don't even know why I do my own channel, Chris. I, I mean, it's got a few thousand subscribers, I think five or six. But um, <clears throat> that. I think out there people have the illusion that because they see us from time to time places that we scratch out a living on all of this, but it's quite a battle. Yeah. I wrote Escape because that was sort of the Bangkok thing um, at uh, the encouragement of Stephen Leather. He's a thriller writer. He has a kind of, uh, knocks out a book a year. Um, he is successful. He sells reliably 250, 300,000 copies of his book of the year. It's got a reoccurring character. I think he's a, oh, um, a cop who sort of ended up retiring out. Um, I mean, really uh, all thriller characters seem to me, uh, perhaps I'm getting old the same. We could sit here, you and I, and invent one, couldn't we? Let's see if we make him, Ex special I've, uh, forces. I've got, I've got one here. Where is he? Um, but this is. I have to. I've got a whole pile of books here. That oh, there we go. Yeah. Are they of that uh, genre? Uh, this, of, is, uh, this is my Hans Larsen character. Okay. He's yeah. uh, This is going to sound really cliche, but he he is a former Navy SEAL. But I wanted oh. to write. I wanted to write this kind of fiction, yeah. but make it more human than the sterile kind of hero gets the girls, got a flashy gun, you know. Yeah, know what you mean, yeah. And That's and you, from your own experience, you can give him uh, a good backstory and a past and, you know, use, I, I expect, incidents from your own life that you probably would hesitate to reveal as biography, but you can weave them into some fiction. Yeah, I only just picked up on that. I was looking on Amazon at your books and I saw what appears to be, you've taken, is, is this right? A, a character from Larson and written stories um, around the same vein. It's a two, my Hans Larson series is a two book series so far. Only because, David, you know how long it takes to write a book. Yeah, forever. Um, mm. I've just finished my third memoir, which is State of Mind. I think on my uh, podcast, there's a picture of it. Yes, up, I've up. seen that. It will mm. be up there. This is the story of how I ran the length of the country. Um, I think that's always of interest to people because, um, you know, um, you know, Okay, you don't have to be a fitness fanatic to wonder, you know, how you could make the most of yourself in, in such a thing and then overcome um, that point of exhaustion where you're looking for any reason to continue. I, I, from some of the things I've read on you, you've had your own way of dealing with that. Um, and uh, the only thing I can compare it to, I guess, in my own life, I, I suppose, 
when I cut the bars of the Bangkok prison at midnight, uh, I found myself at about 3.33, 45, uh, with such a long way to go. I don't, and found I had, I was in a prison within a prison, like the maze, and I had seven more inner walls to get over before the outer one, which had electricity on the top. And yeah, really it was only the threat of what happened to everybody who turned themselves in at that point. You know, they'd all been tortured and killed. Mm. So that's pretty much motivation. But how do you, uh, do you use just your personal will not to fail, to go on with something when your body is telling you, Chris, you should stop now. You're going to do yourself a mischief. Yeah, I, to be honest, David, I just keep going. I, I can't really, I, there isn't really a secret. You just keep going. And, and th there was an, an expression I heard once in the Marines and it was the, the troop was speed marching along. So they're running, walking, running, walking, quite, quite a fast pace in full equipment. And I think it, um, one of the guys that I knew, he was like, he was looking at the verge and he was thinking, if I just collapse onto the verge, mm. I can get out of this. And, and people will just think I've got heat stroke or something. And right. one of the corporals in his training teams just could tell by the look on his face. That's what mm. he was contemplating. And he went, Oi, Davey. <laughs> he said, Davey, if you can put one foot in front of the other, you can keep going. Right. <laughs> you know, you put one foot in front of the other until you lose consciousness. And I'm lucky I've, I've not mm. yet lost consciousness. <laughs> um, no, and also, I suppose, uh, you know, there are some safety angles of, of, of pushing too far. I, I think there's been a couple of marathon runners um, who've just uh, ignored something quite seriously going on in their legs. And um, the, the whole chemical thing in their muscles has become imbalanced. And I think somebody staggered to the finish line, but when he stopped, um, the, the the combination of uh, acids and opposites kind of melted the tissue in his legs. He, he never walked again after that. Maybe that's a you know a real rarity. I'm sure it probably is. But um, uh, I I don't know. I, I think we have to accept our, our bodies. You know, have some limits. Do Do you find? I mean, as you get older, you just get more stubborn, uh, despite the well, years I'm, I'm 51 now and in four weeks time with and i've done no training except i did a a run on sunday all all, all i do dave is i jog around the block about five times a week and that's just for my mental health it's not a right you know, it's not like to get fit or anything although I, I suppose it keeps me ticking over but in four weeks from now I'm kind of planning running 200 miles nonstop. Wow. Well, it will be in 48 hours, mm. which, which doesn't really, if anyone knows ultra running, knows yet doesn't give you any time to stop. <laughs> I, no, might, no. I might be able to snatch an hour of sleep here and there. And I want, mm. I've got permission to do it around my local running track. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've already had my second person tell me that I'll die, and that's okay. Yeah. That's quite, <laughs> that's quite normal when you do these challenges. The problem is, it's when it comes from a professional ultra runner that they tell you that you go, "Okay, I'll just pretend I didn't hear." <laughs> oh well, then that's a good way of dealing with it. Um, may I ask, um, why are you doing this particular challenge? Um, well, several reasons. Um, first of all, just the personal challenge, David. You know, I'm a great believer we get one life. And if you live it right, one is enough. And I'm preaching to the choir here. I suppose so, though. I, I, I think I'd, uh, I wouldn't mind be a, being a science fiction character. And, you know, after I die, wake up with another one in front of me. I, but would we ever get it right? Huh? Wow. <laughs> this is the thing, isn't it? 
Why mm. am I doing it? Well, we've currently got a veterans crisis. We've got a lot of veterans committing suicide. Um, Air yeah, suicide, the great ignored um, yes. cause of death throughout the land. Yes. So my, my last two charity challenges have been to raise awareness of, of, of that issue. Have you got a sponsor or something like that to throw some uh, money into the charities or not really? I, I had a sponsor when I ran, I had two sponsors when I ran the length for the country that very kindly chipped in 500 pounds each towards my expenses. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's funny, you know, it sounds like that's all right, but um, your expenses would be close to that anyway if you're running the length of the country, for sure. Oh, my expenses were probably about, if you include the money I lost by not being in a job. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Then it's yeah, yeah. probably about £7,000. Mm. But I don't think of money in those terms. If, if I just think of the experience. Oh, no, it's true. I mean, and also I think, <clears throat> I, f I find it, uh, now I'm into my 60s, I really just evaluate everything in terms of time. Um, you know, how much I've got during the day, what I can allocate to it. Um, and uh, because we'll run out sooner or later. And probably, I mean, you've done really well to have written as much uh, as you've written, taking everything into account. Um, I think the fiction's uh, uh, great stuff because you can kind of, <clears throat> you said that in no way was uh, writing biography cathartic, but the opposite, sure. But at least with fiction, you can wander around in there. And um, of course, you've probably, oh, I don't know, during periods of, um, uh, you know, when you're in the services, what do they say? Most of the time you're sitting around waiting and then uh, uh, five minutes of absolute terror, but, and then recovering from various disasters. You've, you've had, no doubt, time enough to have read quite a bit over the years. So, you know, you're in a position to um, really uh, enjoy, along with your readers, uh, what, what you're writing in fiction. So mm -hmm. uh, well done on that for sure. How are they being received? People enjoying them? Yes, it's um, uh, God. Going back to what you originally said, I sat down at the computer one day. It was back in the days when I used to be, let's just say, off my head quite a lot still. And mm. and I was at just a point in my life where I'd seen so much of the world. I'd seen more of the world than anybody I knew. Had all these experiences that that really sound like the stuff of fiction or, or could be could be right and and i thought one day look i'm just going to make it work you know you get written off when when you're a uh, when you have mental health issues people write you off especially if it's around addiction because they mistakenly tie in addiction which is a mental health condition with drugs and um yeah uh, there is a lot of uh, preconceived ideas isn't there and so I just thought, look, I just got to make it work. You know, I've got to make it work for me and, and show that there's no regrets in my life. I've had a great life, whether it's even being chronically mentally unwell, I'm, I'm, it was an experience for, for, for me, right? Mm, mm. So I just put the computer on one day. I was a bit worse for where I thought, right, write a best-selling book and, and I don't mean that arrogantly. I'm what I mean is that was the goal. There's no point writing a crap book. And if, no, I, no. if I had written a crap book, I wouldn't have published it, David. You know, we, we would have just gone on my shelf and at, right. least I've, at least I've written a book. Right. But I thought, no, you know, I've, I've always been a reader. So I've got that kind of grasp of wordplay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had through the learning process, I learned how to edit, which is in your mind. It's not a physical thing. It's how, right, what do the audience need to hear about this story? At which particular time? Yes, I know what you mean. You, you find that. Uh, and don't you find that the more experienced you get <clears throat> with the structure of uh, plot lines, <clears throat> you start to watch things in a different way than younger people. For example, if you're watching something on television, you're saying to yourself, right, this is the what's being revealed in the opening 30 seconds. These are the characters being presented. That last 
you know, the, the more professionally the thing is written, the neater is the uh, 45 seconds that showed you that dad uh, has on the surface a, a perfectly legitimate career as a, a, a dentist and uh, is good to his kids and fine with his wife, but has a secret. And, and that can be, you know, on screen, can be done in a short time, but you've got the luxury in writing of doing it in a somewhat different way, but nonetheless, mm. uh, you know, you could have the last sentence of the paragraph change everything that's come before. Um, and, and that can be quite enjoyable, can't it? You know, structuring things. Yeah, it's been an incredible learning curve for me. I'm completely self-taught. I, I taught myself GCSE English in the, in the Marines on a correspondence course. Right. Um, when I, my first draft, I approached people like yourself who, who were published authors. And I said, look, mm. could, you, could you look at my first chapter? And I'm not going to say there was only one of them that didn't come back to me. And that's, mm. uh, uh, I'm not going to say the person's name, but. but uh, <laughs> um, well, we'll call him a loser anyway. Well, <laughs> I, not a particularly savory character. Yeah, um, yeah. But the other three did, and they came back with unbelievably kind, mm. but on the ball advice. And, and it was basic, Chris, par it down. Yeah, yeah. And I had to ponder that, David, for probably six months. I was going, I'm not cutting my story out. Why should I? It's my story. No, yeah, I know. Every word is golden. Every moment is precious. Yes. They, they didn't mean that. They just meant don't use 20 words when you can use 10. And once I saw that simple philosophy, mm. I became a really good editor. So I, you know, uh, I think um, uh, if uh, I've always recommended to somebody uh, who's planning on writing something to look at the best journalism Um just to get an idea of how a lot can be contained in in a short space, um, it, like a description of uh, <clears throat> I don't know uh, you know the five hundred passengers on board the uh, SS Laura had expected the um, a relaxing three week cruise. Uh, when the volcano cash landed, they knew that such and such. You know, a, a, a good journalist will um, not throw in words that don't work, you know, don't earn a living. Those words have, have got to pay off as, as they go along. So it's often a good place to start with that. Mm. Um, there used to be a paper at the International Herald Tribune, which was a, a mixture of, uh, I think, uh, the um, Chicago... Herald Tribune and the New York Times, they used to have a kind of airmail edition back when the weight of things counted before the electronic age. You could actually roll up cigarettes with this, uh, the airmail edition. It was quite handy if, <laughs> if you'd run out of Bible paper to roll cigarettes with. Um, but because they were short of space, that um, it was very lean and you got all you needed to know in a short amount of time. And and you're right. If, if if your correspondents were being you know encouraging yet uh, useful to you, um, they they would have been uh, a, a young guy I knew uh, started a book and and they always say write what you know. So it's a bit about um, his um, kind of life, but it's it's fiction, so he can clean it up or make it more exciting in spots where it's just embarrassing. Um, and what he sent had um, the uh, often the usual kind of mistakes that I've made myself when, uh, I mean, <clears throat> really I needed better advice than when I, I, I wrote Escape, which was the first book. Um, the, I'd written it as though trying to impress my friends in the first draft. And uh, the, the publishers for the UK were a Scottish company called Mainland Public, uh, Ma Mainstream uh, Publishing, um, based in Edinburgh, yeah. took me to a, a very liquid lunch in Soho. 
completely blotto. I, I just couldn't drink that. I, they drank me under the table. But um, I think that's about as much uh, editorial input as they ever made. Um, and But they did at least have the decency to give me a good um, sub-editor. And she... Uh, I'd written some very flourishy bit of crap paragraph about um, men in prison uh, missing the company of women. And, you know, uh, I thought that uh, it was very poetic, the words I'd chosen. And she well, kind of ruthlessly said to me, mm, subpar Mills and Boone. It was kind of like not even as good as uh, the trashy romance novels that were done in the 50s for bored housewives. And, and But she was right. It didn't move the story forward. There was no reason for it to be there. Um, just because I liked it, uh, it's got nothing to do with it. So uh, I learned quite a bit from that one and got better at it. I, my my book's very, my story's very simple. I, I was a damaged young man. I joined the Marines. I did mm. what did what Marines do. Went on active service. Blah blah blah. When it got to Hong Kong, my past caught up with me, mm. and the way that my brain, whatever, tried to deal with it was through this drug, crystal meth, and I just became very very ill, and I was living in a. Uh, in psychosis on and off for, 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 for months, right? Yeah. Now, it, it just so happened that one of the many jobs I got over there, most of which I either, uh, most of which I got fired from, right? Yeah. Well, um, you, were, you were a bartender were you, for a while. I was a, dorm, a doorman. In, a, in, okay. a, in Asia, a doorman isn't quite, it's not like a bouncer, although that was like a little bit of my role, right? It's more when you work in a triad run club, which as you know, in Hong Kong, the, mm. all the clubs, they're either run by the Scottish or they're run by, by the triads. They're owned by private businessmen. But if you're in one yes. tie, you get the 14 K going to run your club, whether you like it or not. Right. So mm. in, in again, in very loosest terms, I was employed by the Dilo, who's the, the big brother of this particular gang, mm. to be their doorman. And a doorman's role in, in, in that kind of club is as much a go-between between, between the, the Eastern face and Western drunken ign ignorance, can we say? All right. Yeah. As you know, there's certain things you don't say to certain Asian gentlemen if, mm. if you want mm. to keep all your fingers and toes, right? No, because uh, they're um, very sensitive to uh, embarrassment, really. Yes. I, I found that in, in Thailand that a lot of decisions uh, and a lot of actions were taken, um, mostly to avoid embarrassment of something being other than it was. Yeah. Um, I, there was, a, I had a friend who was a... Um, a journalist and he was in confronting a Japanese businessman about some um, wrongdoings of his company. And he said, David, I, I, the, the stronger my points, the more silent he went. He just, just froze up. But, you know, you'd understand, Chris, living in Asia, that, um, that, that they have no way of dealing with that. So uh, it, it's... <laughs> it really even I'm I'm thinking of the words used by um uh Hirohito uh in announcing to his people in Japan that um they had surrendered uh to the Americans and the word surrender was never one of them. Um his description of what have happened was not um we lost the war. It was, and also spoken in high court Japanese, so it was doubtful that most of the population would have understood much of it. But um, the, the phrase was, events in, of the war in the Pacific have taken a turn not necessarily in Japan's best interests. And that sentence was as close as um, he ever came to saying we were defeated. Um, and... Um, I think 
there's a word for it in um, Korean that I can't remember what it is. This um, showing deference to superiors at all cost and not embarrassing people. Um, and it came about because of investigations into um, air careers. Um, terrible record in the 70s of plane crashes. They had um, pilot error um, crashes beyond normal and too many of them. So after analyzing the recordings, um, it became clear that the, well, the co-pilot's job is to wake up the captain when he's doing something wrong or to draw attention to something. Because of the cultural setting, he couldn't say it. Um, he might say, um, I don't think I checked the alternator properly or something, kind of blaming himself. But he, he would not directly criticize the captain, say, you half wit, you've dialed in the wrong uh, coordinates for a, a direction. Whereas we as British quite enjoy, you know, ridiculing our friends. <laughs> and uh, I've, uh, it, um, <clears throat> you know, we can take, and, and um, not, not, oh, even ridicule, but certainly uh, correction without having to go out and kill ourselves and commit seppuku or whatever it is. Richard Dawkins, the um, uh, biologist, uh, uh, is always fond of talking about uh, a memory in his university days of uh, there was a visiting professor from somewhere, I don't know where, Germany or something. And his own professor, who had for 20 years um, thrown up proofs of his theory about such and such, you know, the folding proteins of cells or whatever, and dedicated his career on it and written about it. And, and these 20 years were utterly occupied on it. And he was going to, this visiting uh, German professor uh, gave a talk and explained how all of that was wrong. That that uh, professor had sadly not wasted his time, but fruitlessly gone down the wrong avenue and um, this was nowhere near the truth and this was the way to go. Now, Dawkins and the rest of the, the students uh, burst into applause, which took a while to die down when the professor who spent 20 years on the thing and, and being British, went up to the visiting German professor and shook his hand and thanked him for, genuinely thanked him for, you know, straightening that out. And that looks like I've used a little more time than was necessary on that. <laughs> um, and so we in the West, and I think that's part of the success of the West um, versus anywhere else that, um, and it's still, you know, I think it's taken a lot for, um, in, in China, for example, for them to um, have technical innovations because of uh, accepting what's gone before. And and certainly when you were in Hong Kong, that's, that's no different. It might be a more glitzy town, but the um, Asian mentality is still there, I'll bet. Um, yeah. So you were the the kind of um, <clears throat> uh, sort of got, ironed out the troubles one way or another that uh, that clash between uh, east and west on, on the on the as maitre d of the door. <laughs> yeah, it was a. It's a funny time. What I found is the Chinese were very bad at communicating stuff to you. So, for example. I was a DJ in China for a while, very, very short lived career. Um, mm. And the manager, I had a Hong Kong manager, but he was away for a week. So the Chinese, one of the Chinese managers kept coming up to me and saying, I'm, I'm there DJing, you know, DJing mm. my heart out, something I don't, <laughs> just, I had to teach myself. I, what were you playing? What sort of music? Oh, over there, it's very sort of, um, not so much house music, but more the dancey pop stuff. So back in the day, it was Corona, Rhythm of the Night, and mm. Strike, You Sure Make Me Feel Like Loving You. Yeah, okay. right. real, real dancey tracks. And uh. 
So this Chinese manager kept saying, you don't control the crowd. Mm. And I'm thinking in Western DJ terms that he meant like, I'm not taking the crowd up and down with the music yeah, yeah, yeah. in this record into, and I'm like, oh, I am, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing. They're, they're with me. Like, they're Brandon jumping Brock around. A friend, a friend of mine. And I, I was doing what Brandon, Brandon would do. Right. No, what it was when they fired me and, and my replacement flew out from England. Mm. He said, control the crowd, Chris. No. Um, what they mean is you're not getting up on stage and playing silly games, you know, like a, like a Butlin's red coat. <laughs> oh, like, right. Oh, I see. Like uh, one of those uh, uh, Chinese embarrass the, the like guest a compare thing. sort of thing, you know, and I uh. said, why did they advertise for a DJ then? Because what they wanted wasn't what we would call an MC. He said, Chris, they're Chinese. They don't understand it difference no, no, DJ no. and MC or a, or a FBI <laughs> and I was mm. like, um, funnily enough the guy that flew out from England to replace me mm. uh, I think his name was Rob I said I said so where are you from in in England Rob he went oh you you wouldn't know it I said well try me he said ah oh, um, uh, a place called Robra just outside Plymouth <laughs> <laughs> and I said it meant something to you didn't it? and I said at the time I, was, I, I live in Whitley <laughs> half half a mile down the road <laughs> yeah all right well you know it, it, it's funny that uh, six degrees of separation seems to be a, a lot narrower um, for people to get out and about and travel the world I mean how often have you <clears throat> been someplace and met somebody who you only have to take two steps to somebody else you, you knew in, in the Marines, wherever you go, you always meet another Marine. It's just this weird thing that happens. I'll... Do you think you can kind of uh, spot each other across a crowded room in the sense that, um, uh, okay, it might turn out that the guy's not actually a Marine, but could be services of some kind or another? It's almost uncanny that if you think someone's a Marine, they pretty much turn they, they pretty much turn out to be one. Occasionally they're in another branch, say they're an army commander or something. Right. So there, there's got to be um, a body language that goes with that. Or beyond a body language, a manner of um, approaching the room, yeah. I guess. Um, maybe... I guess I'd say um, somebody with that sort of training might go in and kind of scan it, look at the exits, size up the more dangerous people, you know, dismiss the half wits, um, you know, break the room down into um, its component parts for that. Um, I I'd, sometimes in, in, in my travels, I or often would have to do an assessment of where I thought, if I returned to a hotel or if I went back to a particular airport or I went to a stash or uh, where I had something secured in an office building and you know, the air conditioning ducts or something, I'd have to get a feel for if that place had been compromised um, when I, I walk in there. And sometimes you can be wrong, but for sensible reasons. I, I, can't, I was in London and uh, after being away for many years, uh, all pretty good uh, phony documents, went back to my hotel. <clears throat> now, I was wrong on what I thought, but at least I was wrong for the right reasons. As I walked up to my desk, oh, okay, as I walked into the small lobby, there was somebody uh, sitting down at a chair reading a magazine. People do that, nothing wrong with that. But he was a guy, he was within a certain age range, he wasn't unhealthy, no problem. There was somebody else <clears throat> over on a pay phone in a corner, but he was swiveled around, not huddled to the phone like you're trying to keep a private conversation, but half turned around looking at what's going on. Um, behind the counter, um, <clears throat> when I went up to ask for my key, it was somebody new on. So two people then, one came in from the street and one descended the stairs at the same time and it made a little body movement in everybody else in the room. And I was ready for anything at that 
moment. I thought, that's it. It game on. <laughs> you know. You can but, tell, can't you, when something yeah, it used to happen in Hong Kong. You'd get undercover policemen and they'd be British because back when I was there, it was, you know, still... Still a colony, really, yeah. Apparently it still belongs to Britain. Apparently it was only the Northern Territory or, or the New Territories that were seeded. That's true. Uh, new, the, the, um, Hong Kong Island was given yeah. in perpetuity. Yeah, but, yeah. But exactly. um, the uh, leasing arrangement... Um, it was just Hong Kong wasn't big enough. It they had to take the new territories. And Hong Kong can't, re maybe it could today, who knows. But it really doesn't function without the new territories from water supply and, and to, you know, lots of practical reasons. Um, well, now, having had interest there and spent time there, what I personally, I've always been disappointed with uh, Britain's. Um, uh, dealing with uh, the handover, the agreement and everything that followed. But what do you think would be uh, a better way to go if you think there is one? Do you know, ordinarily on something like this, I sit on the fence because I don't see it as my right to talk about someone else's culture, land, wh whatever. You know, it's like the Northern Ireland thing. I'm, I'm, I'm just a guy. I, I shouldn't be, you know, I can have an opinion. Of course I can, right? But I wouldn't start like writing them out or anything, but when it comes to Hong Kong, oh God, they, the British should have just stuck to their guns. And even if there was an agreement a hundred years ago, I mean, which there was, mm -hmm. and, and, but even if it was for the Islanders, they should have just said, listen, folks, that was a hundred years ago. This, this is a, a unique blend of Anglo Sino Sino culture mm society history here it it doesn't belong to to it isn't a part of mainland china once we it gets back to china there's going to be an influx of mainland chinese speaking different language different mm. pretty much different culture um it's gonna you know there's going to be more dr draconian measures all the stuff we know about you know big brother and everything that's happened yes and the british should have been firmer and 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 as we know now that the, the hong kong island was never the chinese's anyway that's always been that was seen that's true <clears throat> i suppose I, I thought that um i ran across uh some cabbie i think uh, a few months ago and the story was in the papers about potentially changing the uh, holders of uh, or allowing the holders of British overseas citizen uh, Hong Kong passports, Hong Kong British passports, to uh, have the right of residence in the UK, effectively saying, well, this is a threat to China. You're going to lose everybody uh, if you uh, mess with our agreement of one country, two systems. Um, but uh, I, and China rattled its saber over that one. And of course, strictly speaking, you know, obviously speaking, China is, is much more powerful than, but <clears throat> Britain was never, didn't succeed with an empire by being powerful in a direct way. Sure, it had the Navy, but that was really, I think, a strategic thing mm. as well as a, a, a powerful force. But it was through, <clears throat> careful handling of, I mean, you think, how, how could it be that um, some measure of, of control was maintained on India, a country of hundreds of millions of people, by um, what was a, a British presence of uh, less than 200,000? Um, <clears throat> in, in some ways, it was, I, I think, it was done by, um, the great finessing of um, and absorbing of, of local cultures to know what to do. I think the the sons and daughters of the uh, Nabobs and the Maharajas, their children wanted to be fine English gentlemen. And so it was easier to get them to go along with something when they, they felt that was the thing to aspire to. Um, now, that wouldn't apply in any way in Hong Kong, but um, it, it seems to me that there would have been, okay, there would have been, to go 
with saying it, uh, we're going to hold on to it, I think might have inevitably led to more of a problem. But perhaps this, if, um, if Britain had said, well, it's been so long now, we'll put it to the people. Mm. Uh, you Hong Kongers, do you want to be an independent nation? And if you say yes, we'll fight your case in the UN for recognition. Now, China wouldn't have been happy with that either, but it's a harder battle for them to do it. You know, it, don't you think so often it depends on how you phrase things? Mm. If Saddam Hussein had had a decent publicity agent, he could have, instead of thundering in, heavy booted into Kuwait, he could have said, um, look, uh, I'm supporting the uh, movement for the democratic students movement of Kuwait. They're objecting to the repressive regime of the royalty of a monarchy, uh, an absolute autocracy that gives them no democratic powers whatsoever. And of course, we support these young people who want the freedoms that you in the West uh, and that relatively speaking in Iraq, I allow as a dictator of Iraq. So <clears throat> it would have been, and if this phony uh, democratic movement that uh, Saddam had set up in Kuwait had uh, been persecuted, as they would have been, by the security services of the Kuwaiti government, then um, he could have said, look, they, they, I just sent in some technical officers giving them support for their logistics to, to try and install a, a government. And also Kuwait was slant drilling into Iraqi soil. They had drilled right along the edges of the border and still drilling down, they were going sideways. Mm. And, and that was a, a legitimate enough issue to, to make some complaint about. But here he had no, he was playing to a local crowd, wasn't he? He might have been a big man at home and, you know, smoking a cigar and shooting into the air, all oh, yes, all great stuff. Lots of statues and, you know, pointing again. And look at it, attacking the um, Iranians for all those years. Waste of time. Fought backwards and forwards. Uh, huge waste of munitions and men uh, for bits of territory that were ultimately all returned to their own spots anyway. Um, really, if you want to get away with international mischief, you, you, you have to make sure you look good doing it. And the British always managed to look good up until a certain point. Well, you've also, there's another factor, you've got to be signed up to the um, central banking system, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's... Uh, I don't think Saddam was, was he? No, and uh, he, he did some very stupid things um, uh, quite unnecessarily. Oddly enough, um, uh, and as long as you weren't involved in politics in Iraq back then, the walking around town was, it was quite westernized. You know, there were relative freedoms, including even under the, um, uh, uh, what was his name? Pahlavi, Resha Pahlavi, the Iranian, um, did he call himself emperor? But was more than a king anyway, he had some ridiculous thing. Uh, if you've ever got nothing to do, look at... Um, the party he threw in the 70s, the Shah of Iran, uh, celebrating, I forget what it was, three, four, 4,000 years of Persian history. It was, uh, um, he built this oasis of tents in the desert, and it's a massive thing. And it, it, back at the time, it was you know, astonishing the resources that went into it. But there was the Tehran Film Festival, girls went to university, there wasn't any trouble. All, all those, um, you know, half-witted mullahs came in and, and really set the clock back as far as uh, terms were concerned. But the trouble with the dictators, they just needed a better press agent. I mean, that could be a job for us, Chris, really. And I mean, you know, why don't we put ourselves about it? Look, men of experience, what do you want to do? I've actually done that job in Iran, funnily enough. Really? Yeah, I, I drove a coach of um, volunteer journalists from Norway to India and back. 
So but, I was, oh, by land? Yeah, oh, o- overland on a, a 12 ton British Leyland school bus. So the, like the coaches we used to get to, to go to comprehensive school. And our mission was to write um, articles on not just communities living in poverty, but communities that were different, like, for example, Iran. And, mm, mm. and it was interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, right. I mean, didn't you have... Um, uh, you would have had to... Some parts of that, back in at that time, you would have had to carry quite a bit of supplies not just tires and water but uh, uh how many how many journalists were or whatever they were uh, was on? we left with about 17 from norway and by the time we got back everyone had jumped ship except about five of us <laughs> five a jump ship or been fired so oh right uh, um but they found more interesting things to do along the way i guess you when you work for organizations especially voluntary ones you know or or ngos or whatever there's there's always so much bloody bureaucracy and and um Mm. over tightening of of safety rules which apply to certain people but not others and everyone just got sort of um I mean, just one one example. When we, I worked in Africa with this organisation, so I taught street children in Mozambique. And the very first thing they did when we landed in uh, Maputo, for having come obviously from South Africa, that was they took our passports off us. Always a worry. Yeah, mm. yeah. and they in their minds, it's like we've had too many volunteer teachers lose their passport on their six months experience in Africa. So Mm. we we keep them here and that's kind of okay. But as you and I know, should never really give your passport to anybody. (laughs) No, no. It's why it's always good to carry a spare. There used to be a guy, um, what was his name? W.G. Hill. He could issue you with a passport to a country that everybody thought existed, but in fact, no longer did. Um, he, you could get a passport for British Honduras, uh, which became Belize, um, and uh, Ceylon. He issued quite a few from there, uh, which became Sri Lanka. So uh, um, things that were plausible, uh, but so you, you keep this thing, and uh, if the plane got hijacked, that's the one you'd hand over. You know, uh, you wouldn't hand handle. Uh, and uh, for example, an Israeli passport or a, a, an American one with a New York address and Harvey Weinstein was your name. Um, now you, you, you have something very bland in, uh, in one of his uh, Can you, David, documents. Mm. with all the technology now, all the, all the hol- holistic watermarks and, and computer systems, is it still possible to get fake passports? I, uh, quite a few years ago, um, when biometric passports were being introduced with uh, the chip, I, I, I shared the same concern. Uh, I thought, hmm, I don't know whether it's going to be so easy to um, duplicate a birth certificate or uh, find somebody that died in infancy and, and put applications through. But my Malaysian friend and uh, a class forger they were knocking out us dollars sold a lot to the iranians he said oh they're biometric don't worry we have for you one week <laughs> they um they pointed out to me that um the biometric chip um it when it, the information on it is uh, a matching comparison with the photograph that's supplied not with some magical um, database that uh, is able to analyze facial features. It used, for example, the, um, the ratio between the pupils of the eye. You can imagine if it's a person standing in front of a camera or a, a supplied photograph, that distance between the eyes won't vary much. And if it does, it's because the head is tilted. Now, it's not supposed to be tilted in the passport photo, but you can work out from the holes in the nostril and the end of where the mouth line is, uh, 
mm. what that tilt might be and then do the subtraction. So the point is, it's only comparing like with like so that if the biometric data had to match the photo that was in it. So sure enough, you couldn't um, have one of the pickpockets go and grab you a, a passport from some uh, traveling Swede with a biometric passport, simply take the photograph out and, and change it. Um, especially since the, um, uh, the photograph now is not a physical thing, it's uh, printed on it. If you look at the, um, the UK passport now, it seems to have two photographs, a kind of color one and then a little black and white one. And if, if you find yourself with a few minutes to kill as the sun sets, as I sometimes do with a magnifying glass in my hand and a microscope, at about 90 times magnification, you can see that the, um, that black and white picture of Chris Thrall is made up of your name uh, repeated as script and in all sorts of swirls in, in uh, darker and lighter uh, registrations of ink as a security device. So there's a bit of uh, work to be done. <clears throat> but um, all it really means is that if you want a second set of identity documents, it's not simply a matter of um, changing the photograph and reprogramming the, um, well, you, the Malaysians can do the reprogramming of the, the, the little chip that's in it. It can be um, wiped and, and, and programmed back in so that your uh, new photograph, or at least the biometric part of it, the, the top to bottom length of your ears and, and that measured in half the size of your head, it's only about six uh, metrics that mm. go into that match. Uh, so, you know, people have a fear that they wander the streets and some camera will pick them up and match them to, um, will be able to identify, oh, yes, this was a guy who got convicted for, you know, growing a loft full of uh, weed, you know, um, back in the 90s. It, it doesn't work that way. All the, all the photo matching can do is say, yes, this person in the street has got a 90% match with this photograph. So you have to throw up suggestions as to who it might be. If you're after a group of terrorists or something, um, you can have all of their pictures. And if you think there might be one amongst them who's part of that group, sure, it'll, it'll help. But um, it is not nearly, you, you can't ask it to, those parameters for what a face is made up of are not fine-tuned remotely enough to identify, um, I mean, you think of how many biometric pictures are out there. Our passports and driver's licenses are pretty much all of that. I, I notice now I can get things renewed or approved by um, just doing a, a, a scan of either driver's license or passport because that photo is held on the, the government's computers. Mm. Um, I suppose that's why they abandoned the ID card. They, they just do it by other means. Um, but that, no, that ultimately, the, if, you, if you really want to um, have a, a, another identity, you know, so either come the revolution or the end of the world or you know, the Russians get serious with us, you know, whatever it might be, or we surrender to China, um, you want to have some way out. I would recommend a European passport, of course, especially after this peculiar Brexit business, uh, which will only end up being a massive you know, 11th hour compromise in which everything will strangely look the same. But you want a European passport, and this is what you do about it. Um, you do, um, you go over to say Portugal and um, get a, a, a residence, um, or put yourself down as being a resident uh, while you still can. Well, well, you st and after three years, uh, you get permanent residency and can apply for a Portuguese passport. Now, they don't know whether you've been staying there or not. It, it doesn't matter. There's lots of sort of half-assed solicitors, lawyers that will collect your mail for you. So 
that's your address. But um, like with most ID things, start early uh, and, and plan ahead. Now, here you can change your name by deed poll, which is an old-fashioned way of saying, I have changed my name. And it has a, a, a kind of fancy-looking piece of paper that goes with it, but it's actually nothing to do with government. It's, it's a kind of this um, private lawyers do it. I've got a box full of them. And um, so that when you start your uh, Portuguese uh, identity, you, you start it off in that other name. Um, and the, 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 the passport that you supply, you, you're only giving them photocopies anyway. So um, they don't really, you, you can change the name over that. That won't matter. By the time you actually apply for your uh, Portuguese um, passport, all of that will have been uh, accepted because it'll be in the system for over three years. So you've got one and you've got your deed poll thing that changes your name. The only thing that stays the same is the date of birth, but that won't really cause you any problem. And, <clears throat> you know, one, it's, it's like guns on a battlefield of the fallen. One gun begets many <laughs> as you travel along collecting ammunition and weaponry. And it's the same with documentation. As, as, as you find yourself, you've got your other identity, you can go somewhere else as a visitor, but plant the seed for ultimately uh, residency. And there's a couple of other ways that I don't really want to give away, but for students of the mechanics of uh, society who will be interested, uh, they should think about uh, the remaining places in the world where your parents' nationality still gives you the right of citizenship of that place. Mm. Now, who's to say, Chris, that unknown to you, <laughs> in reality, um, your uh, parents turned out to um, have Swiss citizenship because uh, of their own parents. You know, the Irish used to uh, allow... Um, uh, um, to get a passport, an Irish passport, providing your grandparents uh, and even great grandparents were Irish. Now, it's, it might seem an odd thing to do, but there are, are more American Amer uh, Americans born in America who have Irish passports than there are Irish people. Uh, six million people have. Um, uh, Irish passports that have a wistful kind of East Coast fantasy that, you know, uh, their great great grandfather was one of the five points gang in New York City, you know, when the, the potato famine people came over. And, you know, and that was the, the IRA used to uh, scrape up a lot of money in um, mm -hmm. um, with the uh, like fifth generation Irish in the US. Um, they, they had some of the best lawyers in town when the IRA got arrested in New York State for something. Um, yeah, they used to have no, no aid, wasn't it? No, North American aid to mm. to Ireland. Yeah, the, um, yeah, that was part of a, a, a wider charity. But And I suppose if you had, which does kind of, it onto another thing. If you have to be tried anywhere in the world for a crime, the US is not a bad place to do it. You can do things that they won't let you. Uh, I mean, here, you're not allowed to um, ask the jury any questions. But there, when you're selecting the jury, you can um, do a kind of ask a couple of basic questions about their outlook on life. Um, and even once upon a time, too, in the UK, you could challenge up to 12 of your potential jurors just because you felt like it. Uh, they call them peremptory challenges, and that's gone with the wind, too, along with their right to only one trial for the same offence. That's gone, too. They're being whittled away, Chris. It's, uh, um, I think, um, the, you know, don't you find it really young people don't care that they're names all over Facebook and Snapchat and uh, uh, TikTok and every single thing about their lives is known to um, the 
pretty big companies and and less scrupulous ones than um, say the very big big ones like Instagram and so on and Google. Um, kind of the subcontractors, the the black ops of the um, the tech world, and we know, don't we, that um, as you type something into your machine, some bit of analysis is creating the music of your fingers, mm. the motion, the fact that you damaged your ring finger once on a um, <laughs> frantically pulling on a trigger of a, a roundless gun or, or whatever it might have been on a tank door so that, that finger doesn't move quite as quickly as the rest. Identifiable as that, the things you look at, the camera on your own uh, laptop, Watching not simply if you were taking an interest in something, but how you're taking an interest, where your eyes travel on the screen, a screen of which it knows, and uh, breaking that down into character choices, uh, decisions you'll make. I mean, it's alarming enough that you'll um, um, scratch your chin and think, I must get a new gate for the back fence. And suddenly the next time you're on Facebook or somewhere, there's a little stream of ads going down the side for uh, uh, gates and posts and all things rear garden. <laughs> it's, uh, it doesn't bother the young ones, but it gives me, uh, and I suppose a few older generation people, a little pause to think, it wouldn't be quite as easy as it once was to just step out of this life into another. Though, um, and it's still, fortunately, there, there's still ways. But, um, right, well, you know, one of the reasons I, I stepped away from the crime world, apart from that it was becoming boring, was um, that there's just too many imbeciles. I can't count the number of times that I'd, have a, a thing going on, uh, uh, like a little operation. And I'd have everybody there uh, in the right place where we could talk and issue the phones out. Like, this is the phone. You're not supposed to, you only turn it on in this area. The, the SIM card is linked to that and, that and that. And then what do you get? They call their mother or their girlfriend uh, because um, uh, their own phone charged too much or they didn't have credit or they found themselves in a hotel room that was, you know, didn't allow international calls off the, the room thing. Um, and it all blows up, completely compromised. Um, and underestimating, I mean, if we were, if I was a policeman today, uh, I wouldn't have to wear out shoe leather. I'd just sit there and ask my computer, Computer, all right, let's start breaking it down. Let's take uh, pay-as-you-go telephones. Got all of them? Oh, millions, sir, millions. All right, I know that. But let's say in this area, what, uh, Clapham High Road. Oh, yes, yeah, all right. And uh, let's use the cell data to confine it to these um, blocks of flats. Now, give me the list of these pay-as-you-go phones that have a disproportionate number of incoming and almost no outgoings. And uh, this is busy from, say, uh, midday to two o'clock in the morning, peak time. Uh, so you know the phone that is getting all these income, incomings and almost no outgoings and virtually no text messages, no data, nothing like that. Um, is the runner for a dealer. Um, then um, what you do is uh, you ask it for uh, the phones that are not making enough calls that a human being living a life would use it for, maybe two calls a day, brief, short, to the point, no doubt. Um, you, you would get the, the second phone that the runner uses to call the boss. Um, and got the number on that one. Um, you've got it within 100 meters anyway because of your transponders. So I'd consider as a policeman, my, my, my work is done for the day. I can land upon this guy when it, when it suits me. <laughs> yes, it's, um, it's the way it's all going though, isn't it? It's reality now. Mm. 
And, and you know what? The dealers keep those SIM cards because they've got uh, their main line for the customers and auction them to each other. There was a SIM card that was fought in a bloodbath only a couple of months ago uh, between some dealers. This was an, this treasured number had gone down seven years and had more customers you can shake a stick at because um, we should say children, not that I recommend it, but don't think all smuggling is wonderful because in the end it comes back to your customer base and you haven't got one and somebody else would be on top of you and not like you very much for it. And no, don't go out and buy one of those highly priced uh, SIM cards with all those wonderful names of people you don't know on it because you're walking into a trap from two directions. But if you're smarter than all of that, good luck to you. <laughs> yeah. David, so, I've, got, I've got to ask you, what, what's, at what point, in, was it Klong Pran, did, did you realise you were going to get the death sentence? And, and how, how does that affect, affect you? When I first went in, I, um, I was so depressed anyway after the arrest. I'd taken elaborate precautions not to be arrested, but nonetheless I was. Um, when I say elaborate, I mean really elaborate. The, um, they didn't know about the, the other passports I had. Anyway, because it went so badly, I was more interested in, I wanted to escape, but only because I couldn't kill myself within the prison. There was no, not enough privacy to do it, no means. You never had a second uh, on your own. There wasn't anything high enough to throw yourself off. Um, I even had the hotel in mind, the Dusitani, because I knew how to get to the, the top floor and how to get to the rooftop there. But once I kind of got over that, um, I never had any intention of staying anyway. Uh, everything I looked at was from the point of view of escape, which building I was in, what the bars were like, you know, in a kind of old fashioned way. Uh, I kind of knew enough about the place that I uh, couldn't trust anybody. But I knew when <clears throat> there was a, an American lawyer there from Hawaii, but he wasn't really a lawyer. He was a, a vacuum cleaner salesman whose wife was Thai and had a flower shop. And he set himself up as a kind of um, lawyer to the American guys who'd get arrested, ask for $12,000 flat fee, he'd say, and I can get you four years, you'll be on four years. And, well, they'd get, the four years was nothing. It was just that they'd be transferred home with their sentence in four years, providing they'd finished everything. But I kind of exposed him for the fraud he was because he was just so irritating. Um, and he, he was also feeding information back to the DEA in the, in the US embassy. And he was the one who told a, a, a friend of his Oh, that Macmillan, he's, he's for the drop. They, they, he explained that they, the Thais wanted to, um, had always wanted to execute a Westerner, but for diplomatic reasons, never could. That um, we in the West always lodge you know, very strong objections to the execution of our citizens, except sometimes. <laughs> I mean, there was that French girl in, um, in Malaysia who was sentenced to death. It was within the last few weeks. And finally, the French ambassador got onto the Malaysians and said, look, we don't say anything when you're just mouthing off about, yes, drugs, da-da, death, all this crap. We're not seriously going to do it. The Malaysians said, yeah, we were. I'm like, fuck. Oh, well, you don't want us to. No, of course not. You can't go around killing French. Said, what? Oh, all right, sorry. And they released her a few weeks later. But... I found out that in my case, I was leper enough. Um, I mean, you can't, you know, the good thing about having a reputation as the, in the worst trade in the world, you know, having sold and smuggled heroin, you can't get any worse off than that. So no, no one can, that's why my correspondents who get my signed copies or whatever, are always telling me their darkest secret because they figure, they might not be able to trust many people, but somebody who's a, such a social outcast as this that even banged up abroad, put a you know uh, no thank you stamp on about fifteen different producers' attempts to do my story on there. Not this guy. No, there's the elephant in the room. 
he's unrepentant, uh, which is not entirely true. I mean, I, I wasted a lot of time. You know, you know, I could have done something better. Um, that's not really repentant, though, is it, Chris? <laughs> that's just wistful. Um, so uh, it was okay to execute me. Um, and I thought, oh, I'd better bring my plans forward a bit. Um, and there were about probably 20 schemes to get out. Uh, one of them, they had an auto repair shop. So the guards used to bring their cars and their families' cars in to get repaired. They'd do so, and then when they were ready, they'd drive them out. One had a, a VW combi van, and I was going to get kind of welded into a, a plate at the back of the passenger compartment. But I did have rather nervous feelings about being welded into anything, as you can imagine. <laughs> so the, the bones of an Englishman found 20 years later in a scrapyard on the outskirts of Bangkok. Um, and also I realized, too, that I couldn't trust anybody very much with the apart from my closest friends and um i mean trust was a very big thing can you imagine you two hours after i escaped or less and it had taken all night it was about seven o'clock in the morning i got i've got a key sandwiched in a um little wooden decorative tag I have to break it like a fortune cookie to get the key out. It's in there because if I was caught and tortured, uh, they wouldn't be asking me, where's this key belong to? You know, you never know what you say under torture. Uh, you don't want to put it down. Of course, the Thais don't really know how to do it properly. I had to wait to Karachi to find out that. <laughs> um, so uh, go to the apartment where um, my Chinese friend is supposed to have a passport and I know from the experience of terrible things that had happened to people that if you stay in Dodge City past noon you're in for it so uh, I let myself into the apartment actually some young kids sleeping in there that other morning oh, oh Harry told me about it. you might come but not likely because they didn't think it was going to work um, I had a lot of luck on the night but I'm in the bathroom because that's where it's supposed to be, in the toilet cubicle because that's where it's supposed to be, feeling my hand up a mirror against a wall, waiting to strike this passport. And bear in mind, it's not just some phony document with uh, my photo in it. This passport has to have been stolen from a, a, a viable and working one within the previous month because it's got to have gone through the computer at Bangkok airport as an entry. It's got to have an immigration card into it, not only filled out with that number also on the computer. It's got to have my face on it, of course, and it's got to have the ultraviolet ink in pink and green, uh, ultraviolet colors uh, showing over the, the photograph. Uh, it's lots of things with it. Plus, I mean, how many people, Chris, can you say, yeah, he's my friend. He's going to do all that. Go up nights, find the Chinese gangs that work at the airport, have all that stuff done on the part, have the thing, place it uh, in there. So I'm thinking, hugely unlikely. You know? And this is a guy I met in prison. It's not like somebody I knew from before. And sure enough, I struck something that felt like cardboard and I slipped it out and it's an envelope and I opened it up. I thought, all right, there's something in here, but it's going to be all wrong all wrong, it'd be unusable. No, nope. it was there, it had the stamps and everything. And of course, an hour and a half later, there was a tense moment as the uh, immigration officer was typing in the details into his computer, and that pause as he frowned and looked at the screen and held my thing. But it wasn't, it was just a delay in the, in the information coming forward. A very satisfying thwunk of having oh, departed that country. Just imagine. Had you seen, um, or was the film Midnight Express out by before? The old Midnight Express, the one that was made in 78. You were what, sorry? You, you're talking about Midnight Express, yeah, the, the original, film that made in 78, it was. Yeah, the one um, obviously set in Istanbul. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was quite a drift from the book, uh, the escape part was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, silly thing. Can you imagine what force you have to push somebody against a, a, a clothes pig to actually render them dead? Quite a bit, I would think. 
Um, and uh, But it had a nice look to it, that film. You know, when I saw that film first, I was on board uh, an Air India flight um, heading into New Delhi uh, on what was, must, I think it was my second hash run uh, to pick up six kilos. So here I'm watching, and you know the way they used to show movies back in those days, that's how old I was. It was on eight millimeter film on a you know clunky old projector that dropped down from the ceiling of the uh, jumbo jets. Uh, and he's being patted down and they find the hash on him and he's in for some horror. But um, the, uh, and, and I, uh, but it didn't put me off, of course. <laughs> it, uh, it can't be deterred by, uh, those little things can be, you know, some, don't you find some people, something will happen that'll be coincidentally connected with whatever you're doing. You know, say you've got, if you were in the services and you, by chance they, they get a call from uh, their old friend, Bobby, who lost a leg in another campaign. Then Chris, listen, he called me by chance, but it's a sign, it's a sign we shouldn't go ahead in the morning. It's all got to go tits up. There are those people who are looking for an excuse to get out of something or, or to somehow throw the responsibility for the final decision on you. Um, and others who um, look at some new bit of information and say, no, that's just something good to take into account and consider. But I, I really, um, it was lucky I ended up on my own the night of the Bangkok escape rather than even it was whittled down to, there was still one willing uh, partner in that, but even he dropped out at the end. And um, it turned out to be a good thing um, because sometimes if there's, if you're doing something that's very critical and you come across new stuff and you've got to figure a way around it, if you're with somebody else, lots of bad dynamics happen then it's even worse if the three people is a sort of a manageable group. But the night that the five ties got out of their dormitory and went to the wall and found they'd all lied to each other. No one had a hidden cell phone. No one had a hidden rope. No one had any friends on the outside. Uh, it was all shit. Um, and each of them had been too embarrassed to tell the other, no, I haven't done this thing. I've been telling you for weeks I've done. <laughs> but if you're alone, none of that problem. And even with one other person, this big Swedish guy, now he was strong and quite tasty. So, I mean, and he helped me on the night. I just couldn't cut as many bars as I, as I needed to. And he, he bent one up and up. I think he was strangling a guard's neck the way his neck was straining and the muscles standing out as he levered just a few inches open of this bar for me to squeeze through and get out. And you know the oddest thing too, as soon as I was out that window in the dead of night um, and clinging three floors up, they didn't trust the foreigners, uh, the farang on the ground floor for some reason. Um, as soon as I was outside, looking in on the cell in which I'd been a prisoner not a minute before, everything changed. Uh, I felt somehow, if, even if I died the next minute, I was a free man for a moment. But if I'd have had somebody else with me, the dynamics of it would have been so different. When we would have found ourselves at, I don't know, 5.30, uh, that glow of dawn threatening over in the east there, um, <clears throat> and there was a moat just below the big outer wall. And the big outer wall led down to what was no more than about a foot of walking space before the sludgy moat, which was, never mind it was full of uh, shit. I mean, we called it Marsba Creek, but it was full of very tangly barbed wire. So you couldn't just throw this um, bamboo ladder that I'd made up over the thing. Had to work out a way of getting over to this little one foot stretch and somehow getting a 24 foot ladder upright, uh, which was heavier than, would have been heavier than both of us. Now, if somebody else had been there, I would have been sitting around there arguing with him about what was the best way to go. But 
Uh, have you ever found that, that you've made better decisions than by yourself than those, you know, operationally than those yeah. that might have been made as a group or, or yeah, whatever? Yeah, I've, I've been in a group where I've, I've, I've been the only person that can see the way in this situation and, and you're arguing with three people that just can't see what you can see. And because of that, you're all going to do this the hard way. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's human yeah. nature, I think. No, it is true. Um, Chris, it's coming up to about two hours now. I think um, uh, if you don't find it too dull, I should come back on oh, time to time. I was hoping you were going to say that. Um, he, um, and as I've got older, I rate uh, uh, meals and sleep very highly on my uh, list of life's activity. I don't blame and, you. And I can smell lunch calling me not too far away. So um, I think uh, perhaps your viewers, if they have any abuse or questions, uh, they should uh, put it down in the description box and we'll do our best to give either lay more useful answers. Yeah. And you, could even, you could even come on my live show. I try and do a live show every Friday. All oh, right. Okay. And the, um, our friends on YouTube, our friends at home can put their questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's a very pleasant way to spend an hour or so. It is. I, I, it must be quite tricky to follow. Sometimes those streams you get um, in between uh, Haya Joey and Yuck 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 and silly emoticons. You'll see a question there and then you've got to kind of pluck that one out. Yeah. To, um, I, to I asked them to put them in capitals so my aging eyesight can... Lunch, five minutes. Thank you, darling. So I can yes, quickly see. zoom in on them. But yes, that, mm. that's an option that we have. But... You asked me writing a book about what happened 20 years ago is cathartic. No, but this chat has been extremely cathartic. I'm, I'm uh, the most oh, relaxed I'm for weeks, I think. Well, I, I suppose sometimes that you get that way. And uh, as I feel myself with you, that, uh, you know, somebody has been through some experiences that uh, kind of leave you breathless. Um, you don't have to explain the silences and the things that don't need explaining so that's always a bit relaxing isn't it yes and uh i look forward to coming back on this and uh i know what to get you for christmas another cat uh. <laughs> yes. all right then okay thank you very much David. and i'll see you again sometime soon. thank you so much you've been an absolute gentleman thank you all right then see you bye <laughs> i'll enjoy my lunch mm. please do <laughs> Hello friend, I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Thrall, I'm a former Royal Marines Commando and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.